Posterity, the New Superstition by Benjamin D. Caceres. The latest decoy set up by the indestructible god of illusions is posterity. Man has been invited to live for various motives. Once it was for the glory of God. Comte proposed as a motive the glory of man. Now we are invited to live for the glory of posterity. Nietzsche called posterity the overman. Socialists call it the rising generation. No one has thought of the glory of living for the sake of living, of eating, fighting, reproducing merely because they give pleasure. Always there are devil gods that call for sacrifices. Always there is the boogie word that demands obeisance and tribute of all our actions. Nothing must be allowed to exist for itself. Everything must exist for the sake of some other thing. The perfume in a rose is only legitimate if there is a human nostril somewhere to be intoxicated. And the perfume of our acts and our thoughts is only a moral or a right perfume if it gives pleasure to the nostrils of God, church, the common good, or posterity. Man has not yet become a good animal. He suffers from ideals, as he once suffered from superstitions. An ideal is a superstition in court clothes. It makes very little difference whether you believe that an east wind blowing down the chimney on a moonlit night will bring you good luck, or that an act that gives you pleasure in the doing is right if it benefits posterity and wrong if it doesn't. The East worships its ancestors. The West worships posterity. The East lies prone on its belly, offering tributes to ghosts. The West bows its head in adoration to the ghosts not yet born. When an Oriental worships the soul of a bit of wood, we call him superstitious. When the Westerner worships certain letters of his alphabet which spell God, or church, or morality, or posterity, we call it the ideal. And a smile steals over the brow of Puck, and Momus reels in glee. Ancestor worship is the old superstition, posterity worship the new superstition. The old bottles are filled with the new wine, but the old labels have never been taken off. We still march under mottos and tramp to all time a thule to the ragging tom-toms beaten by priests and idealists. Still we signal a host of imaginary beings with the godly colored pocket handkerchiefs of our latest trumpery abstraction. All these words that man bows before one and after another in his flight across the face of time are born of the idea of responsibility that somewhere there is something that is taking cognizance of all his acts and will bring him to account for them. Sometimes it is the bearded, concrete Jehovah of the Jews. Now it happens to be a beardless, visageless, vaguely shadowed posterity. The idea of responsibility is as universal as all other illusions. The imbecility of an idea or instinct merely proves its universality. From the feeling of responsibility sprung the most immoral and strength-destroying doctrine that we know of, the doctrine of the vicarious atonement. Responsibility to God was the first great necessary lie, for if the race is to be preserved, no one has ever found a rational reason why it should be. Lies are more necessary to its growth and sustenance than truths. Responsibility to God or gods was the first ideal. The birth boards that clamped and twisted the brain and soul of healthy self-centered beings and changed their centers of gravity from the egotistic self to an all-seeing, all-recording non-entity that had a name but no local habitation. Man is born in his own incalculable anterior images. 
but he came to believe in his all ignorance that he had been created in the image of another, a giant jail warden who allowed him to rove the earth at his pleasure under a heavy jail bond to keep the peace. The idea of an eternal responsibility to this abstraction germinated the first seeds of man's moral weakness, paralyzed his activities, sickened him with scrupulosities, and filled him with the consciousness that healthy activities was sin. War began within him, a war between his superb, irresponsible instincts and the idea of a vicarious responsibility. And out of that shambles issued the whining Christian, the lord of tatters called the idealist, and that mincing prig conscience. The idea of responsibility to God began to wane with the dawning suspicion that man was not a celestial but a sociological animal. Conceiving himself to be this new thing, he now invented a new kind of responsibility called social responsibility. The old mask was being repainted. The phrase social well-being was hoisted into the Ark of the Covenant of lies. An act was now good or bad as it affected the community. Man loved his neighbor for the responsibilities he could shoulder on him. The corner ballot box was the Kabbalah. The community had power to bless or curse the individual. God had become a town hall orator. The recording angel had become a court reporter. The era of the state lie had begun. The transition is easy from the cant about living for the sake of doing good in the community and benefiting the whole to the ideal of living for the sake of posterity. The old obscure doctrine of blood sacrifice reappears in this new posterity superstition slightly attenuated and shorn of its immediate and more obvious savage characteristics. But the old trail of responsibility and life guilt is there. We are told to live for the sake of posterity. We must breed for posterity, eat for the sake of posterity, be moral for the sake of posterity, and even die when necessary for the sake of posterity. We legislate for posterity, rear a child with an eye to posterity, tinker with a social system for the sake of posterity, tamper with the individual liberty for the sake of posterity, construct utopias for the sake of posterity, vote the socialist ticket for the sake of posterity. It is the fetish, the Moloch, the golden calf of our civilization. We who are living, palpitating in the flesh and blood, present have no rights. The ego is not sufficient unto itself. We are only straws to show which way the sociological and evolutionary winds are blowing. We are only the bricks and the mortar that shall go to build the marvelous, fantastic, phantasmal edifice to house that coming holy family posterity. Our deeds have no value unless they feed the bulging belly of incalculable, non-existent tomorrows. We are only as scraps of bone and meat tossed to that fugitive glutton, the future by pasty-souled idealists and the spineless altruists who poison life with their doctrines of responsibility. Our instincts, our very morrow, are to be inoculated by the virus of altruism and our faces beatified with the forerunning rays of the great posterity light. How we are to glow with the shine of right living, all because the altruistic quacks with the obsessions of succubus and incubus have dreamed a new dream which they call posterity. Weak, impotent, helpless before the immovable present, man salves his sore spot with hopes for the future, not being able to regulate his life today. He promises himself a virtuous, vicarious tomorrow, not daring to set up his ego as God and its endless pleasure as sufficient motive for all his acts. He sets up an alter ego and calls it posterity, as he once called it God, then the state or the community. With ecstatic eye and lolling, anticipatory tongue, he awaits for his happiness and posterity, something no one has ever seen, something no one can define, something that could not possibly exist. First published in Liberty, number 402, October 1907.